Hello, hello. Welcome back to Let's Talk HP Lovecraft. If you've not yet subscribed to our channel, please take a moment to do that now. Also, if you have something positive or constructive to say about the story, feel free to drop it in the comment section below and I'll try to get to it in the next couple of days. All right, so we are moving right on through the collection, The Crawling Chaos, a collection of collaborations and ghost written stories, um, uh, stories written under pseudonyms, um, but all connected to the work of H.P. Lovecraft. Today we are on to our third story in this collection, which is in fact the namesake story, The Crawling Chaos. Uh, it was originally published in April of 1921 in the United Cooperative, and he co-wrote with Winifred V. Jackson. Um, like The Green Meadow, his other collaboration with Winifred, um, all the writing is in fact done by Lovecraft himself, and Jackson is said to have provided the idea, the inspiration for the story based on a dream that she had. The way that these H.P. Uh, Lovecraft reviews work is that I give a brief synopsis of the plot of the story and then sort of wrap up with just some thoughts and feelings about what it all means to me, what I got, what I took away from it, where does it fit into the H.P. Lovecraft canon, is it a good story, is it worth your time to read at all? So moving on to that synopsis, um, an unidentified narrator describes the sensations of having gone on an opium trip and how some users have reported traveling great distances under the influence. She says that she's only used opium once. It was under the supervision of a doctor during what is she calls the year of the plague, which we don't know what that means. I'm going to guess Spanish flu based on the time of the, the story, but um, the doctor accidentally gave her an overdose and she had a pretty bad trip. Um, the rest of the story is in fact a description of that journey, that trip that she went on. The narrator um, feels the sensation of falling, and then she wakes up in a small, exotically uh, decorated room, and she immediately knows that she hears a loud, roaring thunder. Uh, drawn to the window, um, she looks out, she finds the source of that sound, which is uh, a colored, I think it was green or blue ocean with 50-foot waves and um, a giant seething vortex and it's eating the land um, of the seashore um, that the house is perched upon. Uh, so she rushes out the um, the back door and moves inland. Uh, there she comes to a tropical land with a great palm tree at the center and dropping down from uh, from the limbs are these angelic children whose voices she hears singing um, singing about uh, great vistas and places, and it, it's very much out of Lovecraft's um, dreamlands. Um, whether that was the intention or not, it, that's the uh, impression that I took away from the whole thing. Um, the children are singing about the the end of the world, and as they're telling this tale, she looks down and discovers that the world has fallen away from her. She sees it far below um, the ruins, and at last the whole thing um, explodes and disintegrates, lost in space. Yeah, um, very similar to the other collaboration between Lovecraft and, um, and Jackson. Um, which was the Green Meadow. Um, it's, it's a bit longer, a bit more detailed, but I'm not sure that it's any better for it. Uh, the Green Meadow worked very, very well in its vagueness, in its brevity, uh, whereas this, um, it, tr it attempts to go into a little bit more detail. And the trouble, of course, with that is when you do that, you have to be all the more on your game to make the whole thing hold together. Uh, so it's not bad, but, um, you know, while it has all the trappings of a Lovecraft Dreamland story, I, I don't feel that necessarily rises to the same level of some of his other stories um, that, that are these sort of short, fragmented tales of, of, of these weird experiences, these weird forays into the Dreamlands. It just doesn't quite capture me. I think it comes down to the language. The language, the prose, is not quite as, as rich, as detailed, um, nor is it as effectively atmosphere, atmospheric, um, moody in its relative spareness. So that's something to think about if you're going to choose this story over, say, one of the other ones. Um, but um, the one thing that was sort of 
bothered me is, is of course, I have no experience with opium other than um, getting shot up with some, or, yeah, um, getting IV painkiller at the hospital once. I remember um, they shot this stuff into me, and it was like, it was like mainlining tequila. It was like sudden uh, euphoric high, but there was no... There was no loss of consciousness. There was no trips. There was no hallucinations. But with that in mind, um, I can't help but wonder that if it had this story been written a couple of decades later, um, closer to the 60s perhaps, um, would the drug of choice been LSD or some other hallucinogenic? And even today, um, there's a growing um, interest in hallucinogenics and also a growing body of research into their possible uses in um, medical and psychological treatment. So I think that um, for that reason, um, because this is based on hallucinations, um, it, it's in some ways probably more relevant today. Um, you know, people speak of hallucinating and, you know, feeling the presence of entities and going on journeys and, and sometimes being helped with it by that and sometimes going on, of course, bad trips. Um, uh, that said, I guess if you if you stick with the opium angle, um, I, I would have liked to have seen it be a lot more horrific and a lot less pleasurable. Um, I think that um, in recent years with the opiate, opioid epidemic, um, um, opiates have been um, a very bad um, stain on our culture and the mis the use and misuse and misunderstanding and then also I think lack lack of empathy by people who are on the outside and who don't necessarily understand or feel any um, any empathy for the struggle that other people are going through and what leads them to this use and to this addiction so um, so with that in mind I think I would have liked to I mean, have possibly seen the story go a little bit darker, a little bit more gruesome, and a little bit more um, in the way of of being a warning against opium use. And and there's a little bit of that um, uh, right from the beginning. The the character basically swears to the fact that yeah, I've, I've used this once and I have no intention of do, going back again. So I guess there is that a bit of a bit of cautionary tale. Um, but I think that um, to hold up today, you almost need to go a little bit darker, a little bit harder, a little bit more detrimental to your health and to your well-being. Um, because as it is, um, this experience of reading it is actually sort of enjoyable, even if it's not the best of stories. Um, it's a little bit fun. And um, if you're going to say opium today, you probably don't want to lean on the fun side, I guess. I guess that's where I'm going. But uh, there you have it. Um, that was The Crawling Chaos. Um, not... Um, not at all connected to Lovecraft's character Nyarlathotep, um, who is in fact called the Crawling Chaos, if I remember correctly, sometimes. It's not about that, but it is very much in that, um, same, uh, that same world, so um, think about that. Anyhow, um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'll be back in a few days uh, with my thoughts and feelings on the horror at Martin's Beach. We're going to find out what that story is all about here on Let's Talk in a Few Days. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, please subscribe. And until next time, keep it creepy.